Okay, recorded. All right, gentlemen, uh, good morning. How are we? Uh, good afternoon if you're in the UK. I'm back. So uh, we have some new guests with us, uh, Britain and Mark, this week. Um, we have uh, Tony with us. So, Tony, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks, Mike. Just trying to navigate the uh, the lockdown and uh, keep myself occupied. Excellent, excellent. Great to have you, by the way. I'm looking forward to getting your insight on some of the, the conversation points. Um, we actually, uh, I've noticed we've got Dennis joining us. Dennis, you're on mute. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. I'm not on mute anymore, right? You're not on mute anymore. How's life? Oh, it's good. It's good. I just got some training in. We're, we're uh, permitted in the club at the moment, so we're working a bit reduced. So it gives us some time to start, you know, moving it ourselves and, you know, rest and, uh, and all of this. So I've been taking the opportunity to do that quite a lot. So feel, feel good. Good, good, good. And I think we might have lost Martin. So when Martin rejoins us, we'll have to um, just introduce. But uh, what we'll start with. I'm here. Are you there? Okay. Yeah, that's good. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. So, gentlemen, um, as we've done on the last couple of ones, and I said this to Mark, we weren't sure if we were going to discuss the quick uh, house life with the, the current pandemic, but. I said to Mark, it'd be a really interesting kind of diary when we look back on this maybe in a, a year or two, just to, you know, how were things in, in our respective countries? So just a quick one. Uh, we'll start with, uh, I guess, Sweden. And, and Mark, how's life with the pandemic? How's it affecting football? Are you still going? Yeah, well, we're still training, aren't we, Dennis? Still doing the training. Our youth teams are still training. So um, that seems to be going okay. They're not allowed mixed teams. So they just stay in their groups. So we're trying to limit the social interactions there. Um, apparently the league, the schoolboys league, is supposed to be starting at the at the weekend. So, uh, But that's another long discussion, isn't it, Dennis? Yeah. Yeah, it sure is. So we, we'll see... Um, how that goes, I guess that, that could actually change from day to day due to recommendations from the government, etc. But that's a, another long discussion. But um, yeah, um, we haven't got a big shutdown. Very guidelines, guidelines in restaurants and bars, how uh, that it's only table service, how far apart each person is supposed to be from each other, practice social distancing. The only information i received about how this is working was today is that the cases are dropping from last week uh, you know, what that says exactly i don't know because we're testing more in sweden but now the cases are dropping i don't know again but that's just how it is here it's very hard to know it's it's kind of um interesting if you follow social media that the um the amount of uh expert epidemiologists now that are, on, are online is directly proportional to the amount of trolls. So. <laughs> Funny. Uh, okay. Britain, how's life uh, in your neck of the woods? Um, life's good. Life's good. Um, we're still on a hiatus. Uh, the, the school, uh, the state is actually closed school for the remainder of the year. Uh, we have typical school, uh, you know, through May uh, into the first week of June. And um, they're calling a year and kids just do their schooling online. And, uh, yeah, I don't think that we've seen our projected peak yet. Um, but uh, hopefully, that comes, hopefully that comes soon. We start to see these cases decline. But uh, fortunately, everybody that I know um is is healthy and and well and uh you know hopefully it doesn't last much longer mm. and um uh, tony uh you're uh you're in the sheffield area correct that, that's correct mike i mean yeah essentially we're um we probably either hit the peak or we, we're about to hit the peak so everything's on lockdown schools have now been out pretty much for three weeks so we're entering week four of uh, uh, home-based delivery and, and online teaching. I mean, it's sort of coincided a little bit with the, the, the East, Easter vacation. So so uh, many of the kids have just been sort of at home 
there's probably going to be an uptake next week when most schools get back to delivering some some level of online education. Um, obviously, uh, lockdown principles are in place, social distancing and, and so on and so forth. So we've not yet got the next government guideline in terms of when the lockdown is going to be either extended or, or relaxed somewhat. But... We're, uh, we're pretty much expecting that, that to be delayed for a period of another one or two weeks. I mean, as far as as far as the football's concerned, from the Premier League right the way through the leagues, uh, there's pretty much a, a complete lockdown. Most players are, are engaging in home-based based training. I think what it's going to take for us to get back to some level of regular training or normality if that's going to ever exist going forward is probably a, another two or three phases where there might be some in, individual integration back into training grounds and of course they'll be back into small groups and, and then groups but I mean it's very difficult to, to try to predict what's going to happen because it's so unpredictable so to speak but mm. but nonetheless we just I mean that's the big challenge for everyone at the moment is that you just you're just trying to navigate what's going to happen next you know the landscape changes pretty pretty frequently, so we just uh, we're just remaining quite flexible. Mm. And um, Martin, uh, you're uh, I won't hold it against you because I'm originally from Nottingham, but you're a Derby man right now. That's where you are. And uh, how's how's it in Derby right now? If you're on mute, possibly I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, same really. As Tony was talking about similar situation. Um, we we live in a little village anyway, so there's not a lot of people, but um, kicking around. So yeah, it's uh, pretty surreal. With work work wise, I work at um, Sheffield Hallam University, um, so everything's online at the minute until the uh, academic year finishes. Yeah, so quite a lot of change, but uh, people seem to be adapting. Yeah. Yeah. So again, we're going to, uh, Mark, I just want to, again, congratulate and thanks for doing that blog that obviously connected to some of the conversations we've been having. And I think uh, it's going to be really interesting to get insight and really just reflect on some of the, the notes that you made there with Tony, with his experience uh, in professional football, Sheffield Wednesday. And then we have Martin, who's obviously uh, a professor there at Sheffield Hallam, obviously talking about some of the things that you're very passionate about about writing in your blog. So do you want to lead us on our way? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, I think what would be really cool if we could just get a very brief introduction from Tony and Martin, just a one minute, just background, quick background. Yeah. Please, Tony. You want to start? Shall I start? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Tony Strudwick, um, currently head of performance at Wales FA. Yeah, Welsh FA and also working at Sheffield Wednesday. So, so pretty much my, my background, Mark, has always been in, in, in soccer. And mm. you know, my journey took me from university right the way through Coventry, West Ham, some, a spell at the English FA. And the, uh, predominantly most of my career was spent at Manchester United working the first seven years with, with, with Sir Alex Ferguson with the first team. And then the last four years working within the academy structure. So, so it's good that I'm I'm probably coming from from two different angles. One, um, I had the opportunity of working in academy for the last four years. So I'm not an expert in youth development by by no stretch of the imagination. But um, hopefully, I can give you some insights. But also looking at you know the the bit beyond that, and I guess coming from from the professional element or the first team experience as well great cheers mark yeah so i'm, I'm not actually a professor mike <laughs> we're not sorry man just need to get out there so uh, i don't get into trouble but uh, no well I, I work at as i've already mentioned sheffield allen university um sort of really focusing on uh, coaching performance main interest of performance analysis skill acquisition uh, and talent development, really. But I suppose I've had a bit of a different route into academia. I left school, joined the forces, uh, spent seven years in the forces, and then sort of started to develop uh, the academic side of things there. 
Um, worked for the Rugby Football League for um, six years, uh, running one of the talent development centres in the Midlands, um, and then ran a project uh, where we redesigned the junior game to make it a bit more child-centred, really, focused on the, the individuals, the young kids playing the game. Uh, and then, yeah, then now I'm working, as I say, for the past six years at Sheffield Allen University. So, yeah. And understanding more about a lot of the things that I'm really interested in, probably starting to realise all the mistakes I made working in, uh, in the field. Brilliant. Really good. Thanks. And thanks again for joining us. I'll introduce Dennis. Dennis is probably the most innovative person in child youth sport in Sweden. <laughs> that, did, any disagreements, Dennis? Yeah, I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to do a quick introduction, Dennis, while you're here? Because you're going to be asking some questions. Yeah, well, I think uh, my, my, my background is yeah, basically sport all my life. Uh, when I was a kid, I did probably eight to ten different sports and grew up uh, with a family with also a brother that was uh, or or is uh, disabled. I think is the word for it. Um, so yeah, growing up with him uh, made me think a lot about how how he developed skills and how he developed movement capabilities. Um, so, and then, yeah, going into play some quarters around my professional football for a couple of years. Um, took me to university, um, studying a bit of, yeah, sports psychology, uh, biomechanics, this traditional sort of stuff. Uh, and also very interested in the academic side of practice. So, so um, I don't really fit anywhere actually uh, I'm, uh, I'm i'm a pracademic so, uh, pra practitioners i'm an academic and for academics i'm a practitioner so i don't really know where, where we fit uh, but i try to to bridge that gap quite a um, um uh, quite hard try to bridge that gap the theory practice gap, uh, and practice theory gap perhaps as well uh and also uh, currently uh, looking at sort of wider aspects to development, like what structure does the club has, what kind of environment, what's the motivational climate in the society, and things like that, and how that shapes player development. So um, really trying to, or my role is very much zooming out while, while Mark would be someone more in practice working with pedagogy. And um, that, that sort of combination is quite interesting, in my opinion. Uh, there's heaps of good things to be done at micro, but there's also macro influences that can assist or inhibit uh, what's going on on the pitch. So, so I'm trying to stretch out uh, to see the structure of the club, our partners, like school corporations, things like that. Um, how do we talk? Uh, do we understand play development? Um, and yeah, go from there really, paying attention to what's going on and then make small, small changes and try to move the club to a better place uh, from day to day. Um, and hopefully as well not be moved by me making some top-down decisions, but it's actually people in the club having conversations of value, which means that I can step away and there is something still there, there is something living. Uh, so I try to really stay in the back seat quite a lot, but observe and monitor what's going on and make small, small, small tweaks. Um, and uh, yeah, that's my little journey and currently what I'm trying to do. Cheers, Dennis. Cool. Okay, um, so let's 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 get some discussions going. I think that a, a great place to start um, would have been would be with this um, really rich quote that Jordi and Isaac from FC Barcelona provided us with uh, when we did um, a pod with them. It's a Cesar Menotti quote. It's those who only know about football don't know about football, and. Um, I think this, I'd like to dig a bit deeper into this because there's obviously some sort of complexity with this rich quote that needs to be unraveling. And maybe that a good place to start, I was thinking, was maybe some of your research work into the idea of form of life, Martin. And I think that if we just kind of can unpack what form of life means very simply and relative to your work, maybe we can start really get digging into this quote. He must have okay? known. Must have, well, he must have known you were going to ask him because he, as soon as you you said it, he left. <laughs> <laughs> I 
happened now? What's happened? Well, uh, why, why don't we start? Why, he has left. He'll, he'll probably come back shortly. But why don't we? Um, why don't we take that quote, Mark, and, and mm -hmm. throw it at Tony? And you know, obviously, he's 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 been at multiple levels of the game now um, from a leadership standpoint. And I, I guess how does that resonate with your experience, Tony? Yeah, I mean, I mean, my take on the quote is that it's probably that that that, that many of those that are involved in football that have only had that experience around, you know, building teams, building football, coaching football, rather than looking at the holistic picture of what, what's required to really to produce and develop young children. I mean, I, and I think part of that, and it, it, it's quite a nice, nice phrase, actually, could it, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but the you know, we have to understand and we have to recognise complexity first and foremost. So it's not just about football, football coaching and, and that experience. It's the holistic environment that really, really, really supports the child. And, you know, looking at the development process, I think, you, you know, wh whatever the, the the kind of coaching organisations and in, in terms of we can pr perhaps get onto that, because I know this is this is one of your, your, your things as well, Mark around governing bodies and, and looking at you know narrowing down to what what curriculums look like and so on and so forth and i think there is perhaps a lack of understanding around certain principles of learning other areas outside of just delivering one a one-off session or delivering group-based training so i think for me that 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 quote resonates with me and that those who you know, those who only know football really don't know about the wider picture and, and the bigger implications of, of what this complexity around talent and development and, and success really, really looks like. Yeah. Dennis, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, uh, I think it's very close to uh, part of my, my, my presentation of myself. There's like looking at the wider aspects and and uh, I mean just a small thing like you know the social media world for for young kids today and you know the instant gratification sort of demand that that they might have and might also be fueled by like parents sort of views on things and what is important now and perhaps not how do we prepare these uh, young players for for future challenges in terms of you know moving into new social mm -hmm. groups uh, being able to cope with with setbacks and things like that, uh, and I think there's a lot of things to be to be said about such micro questions, looking at the macro aspects. Um, so uh, yeah, and I mean you could you could obviously look at history and and things like that as well to uh, try to understand even deeper why uh, young players in a certain culture have their the certain type of motivations that they have. And if they are beneficial or not, well, that that's a question for each club and each individual to 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 understand. But you can also, as a coach, amplify and dampen those influences. Uh, and and if we're gonna talk about intrinsic motivation and learning and these kind of things, uh, uh, I think to to have that wide picture of of society and people, uh, I think is extremely valuable. Yeah, that's brilliant. Because um, uh, what I I was going to say what I what I took from it is that you know it's a game that's played by people. So to you know to separate them and to talk a lot about you know tactics and this player moves here and this player moves here um, and not talk about decisions and not talk about the things that influence decisions is what we're missing the boat. Yeah. So just to add add to that, Mark, if if we accept that the modern skill set for a for a for a development coach or a coach who's changed, what would them them skills look like, and what would be the requirements be in the modern day world? The skill set for a coach. Yeah, I mean, if if we if we're accepting that the 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 game is changing, society is changing. You know, if historically the the coach, like Britain said, is the coach was about delivering and and, and focusing mm -hmm. on one thing. What what are the requirements for coaches now to deliver these holistic programs that? That we, that we feel that, that, that are better than they have been or better than they should be? Mm. Well, I think it's um, we can go back to coach education again, which we've touched on a few times. And actual coach educators, educate, education of coach educators. Um, how many coach educators truly know 
have an understanding of, as Dennis referred to, theories of motivation, like self-determination theory. How many coach educators have ideas of theories of learning or even more ecological uh, theories of development? So I think that I think it starts really for me with uh, education of coach educators. Because um, I, th- I think I know, Tony, you've worked as a coach educator. I've worked as one, Dennis. We all we all actually work as coach educators here. And I think maybe it seems anyway in Sweden for me uh, that being a coach educator is not um, needs to be taken more, I hate the word seriously, and more seriously as more of a... a um, a job that 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 is high up as the same level as teaching, etc. Because it's it's you've, coaches of such impact on young people and also can can give so much to society. So I think that also then, of course, I know Richard Bailey often asked this question that when we're coaching, be seen as um, a real um, form of employment, a real job. There's that as well. You well, that's that's that, that's very common. I find uh, over here in North America. I mean, it's very new. I still think, and that's part, partly why. But it's the, the jobs that we are doing over here are just not deemed as professional. Um, again, it could it could be down to the fact that it's so transactional here. Um, you know, people pay and they want something, um, and therefore that you're at their beck and call versus being a professional, leading your own ideas, trying to implement your own theory, but. Yeah, I'll agree with you. And if that's the case out in Sweden, um, and I'm um, again, Tony, is that something similar you see in in um, England? Not in the professional side, but you know, obviously going into grassroots and and below. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the uh, the Premier League are now starting to take seriously the, the the role of you know somebody somebody within within an academy or somebody that's going to be the head of coaching or, or somebody that. Well, and we're talking mo- mo- beyond just being a coach mentor. I, I think that there's definitely uh, at the at the professional end, if we want to k- call it that, that this move towards recognizing the importance of somebody who's going to coach the coaches and somebody who's going to continue with their their long term development as well. And I think that's really really important. I think historically it would have just been, you know, players would have gone into coaching and and the the, the ideas would have been infiltrated, you know, how they did things and so on and so forth. But I think with with the kind of influx of of different ideas and and what's available to people now, I think mm. I think there is a recognize there's a move certainly in England to recognize the importance of that role. But I think below that, and to answer your question, Mike, below that at grassroots, really, it's still very much ad hoc. Mm. Now, if we think about you know the kind of numbers, the numbers really that that these coaches will influence, and and the number of players that they will influence. Then it then it becomes disproportionate really to the money that's being invested at the, the professional level. So mm-hmm. until we have, I, w- I won't even say a pathway for young coaches, but until we we have more of an interaction of ideas and 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 and, and, and a, not necessarily professionalization, but but almost like it's starting to take things a little bit more serious about what the role of a coach, particularly with, with, with young young players, even at grassroots level, and the importance of that person. Mm. I think that just get, actually just one thing there. Martin's trying to get back in. He sent me a text. He said he can't get back yeah. in. Or no, I'm back in. I'm back in. Are you in? Yeah. Oh, good man, Martin. Have you listened to anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably the last three minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Or so. Well, because we're, we're discussing this quote um, mm. from uh, uh, Sir Samanotti, those who only know about football don't know about football. And the actual question, the original question I asked you was that in, in, your, in your research work, I think this could resonate with some of your research work in, in the ideas of form of life. And I'm just wondering if you could give through your research work uh, this idea of form of life, which I think yeah. it's sort of wrapped up in this quote really. Yeah. Right, okay. Do you want me to just give an overview of that, Mark? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so um, the, the the idea or the notion of a form of life um, comes from a philosopher, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, um, and it essentially describes sort of everyday practices, customs, beliefs, traditions of a group of people, um, and the, the 
the key that what I'm really into, I mean, because that's nothing new in coaching. That there's been a lot of research that's explored socio cultural um, influences, things like power and discipline. Um, but what I'm really interested in is the relationship between different forms of life um, and what does that actually mean for how players or the athlete environment relationship, how does that influence it? We'll just go back a little bit. So when we talk about form of life, um, it's it's more than just the club, or if we put the football club in this context at the middle, it's more than just that. It's everything. So if we use, uh, so I'm heavily influenced by ecological theory. So James Gibson and uh, Yuri Bromfrenbrenner. So think about Bromfrenbrenner's uh, model of uh, bioecological model of human development so there's three different sections and we've used this to really understand more about a form of life or sorry four different sections so so relevance for football let's if we put aik at the center number one is the, and there's no particular hierarchy here but would be the macro level so the the wider socio-cultural constraints or factors that influence um the players, the parents, the coaches, the club. So that's a lot wider. And then at the very middle, you would have, or on the minute level, you'd have the uh, the microstructure. And and the two in between, we've got the exo uh, system, and we've got also got the uh, meso system. So, I mean, I'd, I mean, I'm sure you can direct to people. So I don't want to go too much into detail about that because I'll steal the, uh, the show, but. So we have to consider everything. It's not so we get a lot, don't we, in football? What I see on the telly and reading and what have you is that oh, it's about developing the culture, and we have we sort of mapping these ideas and behaviours onto a team. So we have you know our values, but then that's not really culture, really. That's just that's just some behaviours and values that you trans. Is he? I think we've lost him again. That he needs to put 50p in the meter. Yeah. But the thing, I, I think, uh, I think what um, just uh, what Martin is touching on there is the the different like um, influences, and there's a, there's a line here from Jordi and Isaac uh, that says the culture the cultural context invites m- many of of the coach's behaviours that we see today. How the coach does a session is an emerging behaviour of all influence of context of culture of society. And that, that's a really interesting quote. And I think that's kind of what Ma- Martin is trying to capture. And I think this is kind of also captured in the Tales of Minotti quote, those who only know about football don't know about football. So mm-hmm. I think, Tony, have you, have you, how was your, how do you see that, that quote, the cultural context invites many of the coach behaviours that we see today? Yeah, I think it, it. You know, in our perspective, what, what's what's been quite interesting is that you know, as part of this this kind of elite platform and plan, and you know, whether whether it's elite at that level is is another discussion. Albeit, I think it was around many of the clubs mapping out what their coaching DNA was, and I think that that's been an interesting journey, Mark, for a number of different reasons. Because you know, it, it's forced clubs to look at how they've evolved and, and and some of the existing and pre-existing conditions and so on and so forth. But the flip side of that is that it's also kind of, you know, you know, we can't capture that in, in one kind of static time point. And I think that's the important thing around that is that when you say about the DNA of the Liverpool way of Man United or whatever way it is, I mean, that's going to be fluid and, and continue to change. So I think for me, it's about understanding that, the people that are involved, the context of the situation, but also the time point of that. And I think that's really, really important. I think the other thing is when we flip this to development, and, and this is probably a, a kind of bugbear of mine, is that much of the research focus has been the individual characteristics of the athlete as opposed mm-hmm. to the talent environment itself. Now, you know, the discussions that you guys are having and, and, and these, these, this kind of this kind of forum now allows to think wider beyond that because 
you know, the net effect mark of just studying individuals is, you know, it's, it's a, the 10,000 hour rule and, you know, mm. strength and power in individuals and rather than looking at the bigger picture. And I think that probably, for me, that's where, you know, I've enjoyed these discussions with you guys because it gets us to focus beyond that. Mm. Yeah, sorry, back in, Jen. So, so, so what Tony described there, I'll continue with that video if that's all right. But what Tony described is what what Mark you 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 use this as well is like uh, an organismic tree. So it's always been the focus on on the individual and not necessarily the environment and how that can inf how that has a really powerful effect on on development. Mm. Okay, like an organism, a cemetery is where you find. Okay, yeah, because I think this is, and then this gets back to the original question about coaching and coach education. Is that there, there's certainly um, a dominant paradigms there. I mean, this focus on the individual is like up until recently in Sweden, a lot of the coach education courses were just based on technique, where you explicitly taught a technique to a child. I went so far as they had a book called, I think Dennis can back this up, a book called A Technique Register, which was, I don't know, about 60 to five different techniques that were essential. And you were actually, as part of the education, you were taught how to explicitly coach these techniques. So I think this is, and um, also you see this in the planning paradigms we have in coaching still. We discussed this with Barcelona, where the coach has the theme, brings the sequence, uh, decides uh, each block of the session, then decides the order, and then has coaching points. And remember, Tony, we discussed this when I was over with UK, is that, is that in so much of coach education, where you see coaches with their coaching points and actually only looking for coaching points yeah. in the thing. And it, so this is, again, there are wider cultural influences where these ideas come from. Yeah, and uh, you know, to go on to that, Mark, and, and we've spoken about it a number of. I think it goes back down to about experiences as well. Is that when you look at you know what what the fundamental role of academy, and, and again, that's something that that I'll open up is that what is the role of an academy? Is it necessarily just to provide a runway into the first team, or is it to provide a range of experiences to 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 maximise or give give young people the the opportunity to develop? Now, I think because we've always been always thought about the, these linear or these template driven curriculums and programs is that it's almost like a, a linear process to, towards the elite end. But as you well know, it's a lot more complex than that. Now, I'd like to map, perhaps start to map out what different experiences young children and, and you know, within that development of like, what they look like. So it could be, you know, your games program, your training program street football whatever that looks like you know player led so these kind of experiences that really and you're thinking about the wider rather than just thinking about these individual technique drills that, that are really sort of mm. been mapped out from one coach and or from one club. Mm. the question tony i mean i know that a lot of the um the clubs we've spoken to so far they have their own um you know football research department and you mentioned that it's you're still still not really widely um, do we have individuals at the club that are basically studying more the theory and the methodology. Is that something that's starting to, you know, is it occurring at your club or have you seen it start to appear in other clubs? Like AIK have their own research department, Barcelona. Obviously, we spoke to Jordi and Isaac and there. Is there anything like that starting to occur and pop up now within the, the Premier League and the, you know, the, the championship level clubs? Not I'm aware of. I mean, I think I think a number of clubs are starting to generate these kind of insight and development kind of departments, which realistically will be about it will be sort of quantitative stuff and metric driven. So how many how many appearances, numbers, how quick little Johnny is at 12 and how quick he's going to be at 16 and so on and so forth. So I think a lot of the research and development has gone on, still been around, you know, Play, player metrics, individual player metrics, but the wider component of that, no, I've, I've not really seen that. Now, you know, I might be doing some clubs a disservice, but I've not been aware of, you know, the, the kind of stuff that's going on uh, uh, over in Stockholm. Mm. 
Uh, I can <clears throat> just uh, uh, that uh, it's it's really a <clears throat> um, an, uh, in terms of you know in academic words you know it's an ontological sort of shift uh, that needs to sort of be had because like what what phenomena is actually trying to understand here uh, is is it um, is it something that operates under the principles of complexity or does it operate under principles of mechanistic or linear uh, domains and practices. And if you look at like how society developed, you know, you have industrialism and all of this from where academia was born. So, so it sort of makes sense as well that academia is also like going that road. And it's hard today as even different parts within the university struggling for funding and things like that. So they don't even want to integrate things. So it means that, you know, they want to sort of in general, you know, keep their sort of domain uh, interesting, get funding and produce uh, data. Uh, but, but the actual effect of that uh, is, is questionable, in, in my opinion. Mm. Martin. Yes. You, you as, as we are, I guess, I've read a lot of your research as part of our research group in Sheffield. And I think what Dennis is picking up there in the mechanistic. Yeah. Um, um, worldview. I think maybe you can actually just give some examples in your research on that maybe. What What is meant by this and how it's influencing skill acquisition and learning and talent development? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I do I do feel that uh, this mechanistic approach, this linear approach, so um, you know, it's almost this recipe book approach to coaching, isn't it, where I mean, you've already discussed really, uh, but we have these very um, sort of robotic ideas about what player performance looks like. I mean, I can't comment too much in football, um, but maybe other sports where it's quite structured and, and we've got like this optimal movement template, what not only technique, but also tactical play might look like. And I definitely think that our socio-cultural uh, di it's got a socio-cultural dimension so it might and this is back to the, the former life idea so um, I definitely fits, it, think it fits a wider socio-cultural idea um, and of course that then filters down into uh, education, parental beliefs about what sports should look like, what training and practice should look like and then at, at the centre of all that of course you've got the player um, the developing players, the coaches' ideas about that. So it's just reproducing these these uh, ideas of how practice should look like and talent development practice as well. So not only on the micro level, but also the uh, the longer, you know, the weekly, monthly, the yearly ideas of what of what systems, talent development systems should look like. Mm. Uh, I think that's a real challenge as well to... Um, to maybe look change that. Mark, but you've investigated some of this in your research, where they come from, some of these uh, yeah, uh, yeah. ideas. Can you just yeah, briefly so, get into that? Because I think you, you made some very interesting points in your work. Yeah, so, well, I, well, to study this, I've used the sport of rugby league because uh, that's that's an area that, or a sport that I've worked in. Um, so, we set about trying to understand the uh, the form of life on those four different levels that I explained. So, and if we think about the sport of rugby league, it's predominantly played in the north of England, and it was really it was really born um, out of a disagreement um, uh, between a diff between a different union. And essentially, the working class players needed to get paid for missing time to play the sport. But anyway, I suppose the point you're getting to is that that sport was born in the or born out of the industrial era. So a lot of players, spectators, trainers, as they were called at the time, uh, would work in the, uh, the the sort of local industrial revolution. So whether that's mining, sort of glass houses, docks, these types of things, factories, where there's a, a very repetitious type style of, of working. And it was heavily influenced by um, American called uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor, and he had this task system of management, where you, you know, you, you if you were on the shop floor, you didn't think for yourself, you didn't you sort of had no no innov innovation was allowed, and you did 
as the sort of shop foreman would tell you. So it has, it's got lots of cinnamon uh, things that are very similar to um, coaching in that sense. So it just sort of would fit with the, the wider socio-cultural ideas of how you would work in the factory and then how you would play sport on the weekend and whenever that might be. So, so we've sort of conceptualised that to try and explain maybe why certain aspects of, uh, of rugby league, of coach education in rugby league, of practice design in rugby league, talent development models are the way they are. Mm-hmm. Does that resonate with you, Dennis? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and um, uh, I was just thinking about what what, um, what Tony and and uh, Mike was on earlier as well. It's like, you know, when when we talk about how how complex it is, we also need to just embrace that we cannot know all these connections that are happening around us, you know, in their social lives. And what what but what we can do is that we can. And and of course, there's no there's no silver bullet. Uh, there, there's no model. Uh, I think it was uh, Dave Snowden who said that there, there is no valid model of a human system but the system itself. Uh, mm. And what that sort of brings light to is that don't look at a template or blueprint or curriculum. It actually focus your attention to what's actually going on. Pay attention, get deep insights, and from that you can make informed decisions in the moment that are probably likely to be more suited for that context as opposed to a, a theory that, or a curriculum that someone would just like to adopt straight in. So pay attention to, to, to the environment, to players, to the parents, to the wider aspects, and, and then make an informed decision. So that, that yeah, that's uh, some sort of well, summary that uh, yeah. comes through that's my mind. excellent. And you know what? This fits nicely. I got a message from someone after when I, we did the blog about uh, and after the podcast with FC Barcelona, wondering why, why why uh, Jordi and Isaac didn't talk directly about how they work in Barcelona and their principles of play and their principles of working. And I said they did. And they're going, they never mentioned it. But they did, what they didn't understand is they, they were talking about the, the also the wider cultural influences and, and the coach and who the coach is and what the coach is doing and why the coach is doing and why the players are. They're talking about principles of learning and Lot and a more ecological theories as well, and they were speaking about interactions at different levels, at the micro at, and at the macro. So it was really interesting, and it's, this just ties in nicely to what you said: is that they, there's it's not about a curriculum because there's no one size fits all, and what works in Stockholm may not work in Halifax, and doesn't work in Sheffield, doesn't you know? It's about really just investigating your own environment in some way and understanding it and having some principles and maybe th- a theoretical framework even to work around, which could be. Yes. You know. So the world is the be- is its best model, Mark. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, and you can think about that for practice design and you can think about that from what Dennis was talking about on the, on the more wider scale. So the world is its, is its best model. And, mm-hmm. and I know that's quite an abstract comment, but if you really think about that, I think that should, that really sort of sums up for me what Dennis was talking about. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. And, and this, this text the message I got about the, uh, this, oh, why didn't they talk about what Barcelona do in their prince shows really how much people are just looking for answers. So when we, yeah. and back, let's go back to the first question. Tony speaks about coach education. Coaches tend to just turn up looking for answers and coach educators do everything to try and give it to them when we shouldn't be. Yeah. What do you reckon, Tony? No, I think that's that, that comes from the kind of fixed template coaching as well, Mark, in the, mm. you know, in our desire really to, to capture. And I, I think that's probably been one of one of the kind of byproducts of this this E Triple P in the Premier League about, you know, defining what you do and creating a runway and this linear process and you know, I think that probably needs now, you know, in the current landscape, it needs to be sort of readdressed and re-looked at. And, and mm. you know, to say, you know, are we moving further away from, from you know, the historic origins of the game? And are we moving more towards this early professionalisation? Mm. Um, and with that comes a pressure on clubs to almost produce like a, a you know, this talent, talent 
assembly line of players into the first team rather than looking about or well, how, how can we, we bring it back back to the community how can we bring you know the football experience back really to towards this this kind of this this social dynamic and I think that's that's pretty interesting particularly in the current landscape with like you say early selection models the, the pressure on clubs to compete for players at 9 10 and 11 and 12 and I think that's probably you know I open up to the floor is that are we now going to enter a period of, you know, readdressing the balance of what it looks like and, 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 and putting a little bit more perspective on the things? Yeah, so I, I've, I, got a, I've got a question um, or, it's, you know, just something to pose. But, um, again, it's our desire for certainty in, you know, planning. And I think when we look at planning, it's, you know, it's high level. And so now they want us, you know, to have a plan from start to finish you know, a plan for sixes and, you know, six to 19 or whatever. But uh, the plan, I think what we're addressing doesn't necessarily accommodate or, or um, make affordances for the complexity of, you know, the different environments and the individuals and how does the individuals change over time. So I guess the question that I would ask is what are, what are the benefits of having such a plan and what is the downside of having such a plan? A plan that deals with the complexity, is it? Well, I think when we when we talk about the DNA, um, okay. you know, when I was going through my A well, license, I had to linear. put a style of play together, you know, for everybody from you know seven to nineteen. Well, I mean, I think you know, on, on that question, is that uh, anything that that distracts our attention from from paying attention, attention to, to uh, interact with these individuals and understanding that wider context. If if a plan is inhibiting us to pay attention to where it matters, then it, it doesn't help us. So it's it's not necessarily the plan itself, but it is like when, when coaches get to their you know office or whatever, are are they actually thinking about paying attention to what matters there, meeting these individuals, or is it about the planning, what's going to be analyzed, you know, what data is going to provide? I'm not saying that those things does not have value because they can have, but as soon as it distracts you from the core uh, task of a coach, in my opinion, that's when when it's probably not beneficial and you should be, probably remove it uh, to, to actually emphasize what matters and then perhaps build on these things again. But I, I, I'm just, my feeling is that that the part of paying attention is lost. Mm -hmm. Great answer. And it, does that come does that come down to then? I guess the point that was being made earlier with Tony, like everything seems to be analytical. It's it's all kind of data driven, so that they can manage it. And really, a lot that you can't measure it. it you just have to be present. I mean, is that? And I guess Mark it comes back to your point that you wanted to talk about. Is you know, is there a danger that we are now just drowning in the data? At at the. No. I don't know. Well, yeah, my, my question was about drowning by numbers. Actually, I just wanted to get a Peter Greenway film in. Um, so he's a film called Drowning by Numbers. So I was really happy with that. <laughs> so, um, but like this increasing influence of data, yeah, is, is there, what are the advantages and disadvantages? And I think Tony would be, as he's worked uh, at, at many different levels, probably within this sphere, might have a good, uh, some good insight for this, about the advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. Okay, again, just before you start, Tony, because I, I think if you link it back to Dennis's point, is it taking us away from actually being present to the holistic environment that we're supposed to be yeah. tuned, attuned to? Because we're not there. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I think I think the thing we, we, with the metric, you know, I come from a sports science background, so you know, it was always for me about quantitative analysis. And when I when I dropped down into an academy environment, the first thing I wanted to do was, was try to measure performance. Now. You know, I spent two or three years trying try, trying to measure it, only to realise that it was probably rather futile to do so because it, it, it's so so complex. But I think one, it's easier, and I think we, we've also had this kind of um, this infiltration of technology to, to to try to give us you know performance measures like you know GPS and, and and I've spoken to Mark about this. You know, the value of of sticking a GPS monitor on, on a 12 year old for me, it's just, it's just, it's just not worth it. But I think the way that, because it's been so mechanistic about, um, you know, we take a player in at, at X and it, we, we've got to track this journey and, and, and put measures in place. We've, we've lost sight of really 
what holistic development's all about. And it's more about the environment rather than the end product. And I think for me, data's great, but data shouldn't shouldn't necessarily it should it should help as a guiding principle, but it shouldn't be the driving principle behind developing young players or or even at the first team level. You know, I think there is isn't even now at first team level, there is a really over reliance on data and and numbers. One, because it, it's a lot lot simpler to to record and manage and it takes less kind of brain power to think about other areas of, 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 of influence and experiences. But, you know, our desire really, and I think this is also been a part of the, the kind of this, this pursuit of the 1% difference. You know, we've looked at that and, you know, trying to create high performance models for 12, 13, 14 year olds. And, and, and our focus and our narrowing of attention on the one percenters, the metrics and one percenters, we've lost sight of the bigger picture, which is the 99% of what the environment actually really looks like. Absolutely. So could there be accusations laid at the overuse of data-driven and technology, of, of data of, of that and technology in is also gives the illusion of professionalism? Yeah, for sure, Mark. Absolutely. And I think the, the other thing is, is that this over-reliance on what the actual individual does at every, every stage and, you know, measuring, you know, certain performance criteria and, and benchmarks and so on and so forth is that, yeah, I think it's distracted away from, from the bigger picture. But mm. for me, you know, and, and the, the challenge you have is that there are so many academies and there are so many clubs operating. And of course, if one one academy feels they're getting a competitive advantage by measuring and, and going down and really drilling into this kind of these, these what I would call adult type performance measures, then everybody else really wants to follow suit and copy that because they don't want to be left behind in that pursuit of, you know, getting the competitive advantage through through certain measures of performance. Hmm. I think um, maybe like, have you had experience of where we'll say, there has been some data collected on certain players and when you when that data is analyzed you kind of say okay this player can only do this or do this now at up you know at this game or should, should maybe not play the next game or should we come off have you seen actual players kind of basically go against the data prove the data wrong maybe in some way well, absolutely. I mean, there's always going to be, you know, it's not always that the biggest and strongest that gets to the top. You only have to look at Lionel Messi for that. You know, mm. Paul Scholes would be another one. Is that if the the only criteria for judging the potential of this player is based on, you know, ten ten meter sprint time or thirty meter sprint time mm. or or their performance on a on a certain endurance test, then, you know, we probably would have lost a lot of you know, extremely creative, talented players that, we, you know, we wouldn't have had the enjoyment of watching them play. So, but I think, you know, that, that's probably at the individual level. Yeah. I, and I've also seen the net effect of around, you know, certain research papers generating normative values for what, you know, players should be doing at 15, 16 in terms of GPS metrics. And I think that in itself, Mark, can 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 create an obstacle of of you know not not allowing our players really to do certain things based on these recommendations that really are only normative values. Because mm. you you actually showed me one when I was in Sheffield a, a player in a cup game going to extra yeah. time. Do you recall that? Yeah, yeah I do. Would, yeah. Would you like yeah. to mention that? Because I think this is really interesting. No, we, 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 I mean, we looked at Ryan Giggs and, um, you know, I think at the time he was 30, you know, 38, 39, so one of the oldest players in the league. And, you know, we had, we had a game at Stamford Bridge where he went into extra time and, you know, the distance he's ran and, and performance level far exceeded our expectations of what we would expect him to do. So for me, it was around, you know, what was our our our, our kind of ceiling point for his performance level lowered because of this normative data and what we felt he could mm. do. And I think that's always going to be the danger of, you know, the, these overly driven performance centric kind of models where you're saying, you know, you, you're, almost, you're almost putting, you know, the brakes on certain players rather than, you know, it shouldn't be about what they can't do, it's about what they can do. And I think that that's probably sometimes the danger of, of, of this sort of information-driven world we live in, Mark. 
Okay. So that, that idea right there is, uh, it, it, it's everywhere. When we look at the frameworks for youth and we look at U7, okay, U7s can understand, you know, pass and dribble, but, you know, don't talk about spreading out or, you know, these concepts. But I think when you put them in the actual environment, and you just give them the task of a hey, score a goal. You'll you'll see what they understand. Like right, we'll we'll see what the uh, you know what the limiting factors are for that particular interval. Um, and defining it sets an expectation for coaches that these kids don't understand this and they understand that and they're egocentric. They don't have the capacity to understand sharing, et cetera. The, to me, those ideas can be really dangerous. Definitely. Good. Yeah. Very good. Mm. Mark, I, I have a question for, for the group in general. Like, I think tying this all back together is obviously quite systemic in all our systems. So, for example, I think about Canadian Sport for Life, <clears throat> great organization, but, you know, we're pushing for these, this term of long-term athlete development and obviously long-term player development as if there is stages and that, that everyone has to fall in at a, a moment. And if you're not falling in at that moment, um, which is data driven sometimes, sometimes it's not, then you're, you're no longer there. I mean, it seems to me that, you know, it, the system itself, and that's not just, you know, clubs, this is this is not just governing bodies. This is federal for Canada, federal, I'm sure, for the US, national. Everything just needs to be stripped down and we need to really look at this because even the language is making people who are supposed to be professionals fall into these traps. I mean, this notion of long-term athlete development, just it's athlete development. Why are we using the word long-term? Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I was actually thinking about uh, the, the terminology that we use uh, and that in certain terminology also brings with it some assumptions that we doesn't necessarily pay attention to. So that would perhaps be something like you know, if you go to an instructor, uh, so that, that word in itself tells you that the one that you're going to have all the answers, so right. this person is going to instruct you to do things. So it just puts the emphasis on this top down delivery type model uh, in, in a simple word like that. Uh, same with, um, um, you could say, yeah, producing players, for example, the, the word producing is definitely a, a term, term that would fit very nicely with, with the industrialism and the mechanism and the linearity. Uh, so by actually looking into the micro, what words you use, you can actually uh, uh, help uh, some sort of cultural change but by just changing small, small words that actually put the emphasis on what we're trying to address. So if it's about you know fostering people or player development, something like that would be more more suited than a production line of players, for example. Um, so, I, and I would actually say that that culture culture actually catches up with language. It's not really the other way around, and that that's the so so micro changes in a language can actually shape uh, conversations, assumptions, and also in the end, um, potentially can help cultural change as well. So, it, it, it devil is is in the details there as well. I'd agree, Dennis. And when we speak about long term as well, you coaches keep thinking about the long term when children really are only care about the short term as well. That's right. So we have to we have to look after the short short term needs of the children as well, even though we're thinking long term. Coaches sometimes forget about this as well. You're not present. I mean, if we link it and yeah. put it all back together, you're just not there. You're not present. And you're, you're as to Britain's point, you're looking at kids uh, where they should be. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get them to this point versus, well, what do they need from me today? And you can link that all the way up to the professional level with obviously Ryan Giggs. What is he capable of doing today versus what we think his metrics should be? It's all linked together. Yeah. I mean, I think the, um, I mean, that's a really good question about the, the long term athletic development because. It's been quite prevalent now in on coaching courses, and it, you know this has probably been around in in the UK for twenty odd years. And I think so, sometimes it's quite nice or it's quite comfortable for for coaches and organisations to, to to work towards a model of performance rather than thinking, well, there are always exceptions to the rule. You know, that players will develop at different levels and at different times and. And I think what it's done is, is really focused our attention on the, this kind of what Mark says is this one size fits all approach where 
we know it's more complex than that. Or, you know, I think when you think about it, it is more complex than that. It's not just a case of, you know, a player comes in at this level and they're going to go through this, this, this kind of linear, really neat and tidy development journey right into the first team. But, but, but then models in themselves can be dangerous because the expectations from parents, the expectations from coaches are that it's going to be this nice, neat, neat process. But what happens when, when players don't hit certain benchmarks and they fall behind in certain areas, but they may develop, you know, kind of coping strategies to still get them through that, through that system. So I think it, it's sometimes it's easier to sit back and be template driven and work towards a model rather than thinking about the flexibility around that. And it, it really is. It, we, we, we keep saying it's not a one size fits all approach. And, and also that coaches and um, coaches can also point to this model. So if it doesn't work, uh, it's the model's fault. It's not the coach's fault either. <laughs> that, that can also be uh, a challenge. Yeah, we should the really go. The ages and stages don't exist either. So. Yeah. But to Dennis's point, that's a deflection, obviously, because you know there's probably a level of. Uh, stress on the coach because they've got this model that's telling them that their players must be at this stage by the end of this point, you know. And it, I guess it, if we think about, um, you know, Isaac and Jordy's conversation about l allowing the coach to, you know, improve their own optimization through op when they're working with the children, they're not allowed to do that because this model is telling them that no, you've got to have the kids at this point. And that can stress a lot of people out. Mm. I think. I think the other. The other issue with that as well, Mike, is that it's easy then to blame the individual, i.e., the player. Yeah. That you're not. You're not doing the. You know. So this is back to the uh, the point that was made before about the individual focus. So not is it only a focus on the individual in terms of the development, but then it, it, it's a get out that the, the individual's not adhering or achieving these certain milestones yeah. along this pathway, and that. And that's also problematic rather than looking at the whole, you know, what is the, how is the macro level affecting it? How is coach education affecting it? How, how is other factors affecting the individual's development? Yeah. I think uh, Bastian touched on that when he spoke about um, <clears throat> uh, Virgil van Dijk's development. And at 13, they, they had somebody evaluating him as somebody that, at best, would get into their second team at senior level, because that was the measurement at the time. Yeah, and we, you know, so I think there's um, there's a lot to be taken. This should we move on to just a final bit? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's kind of a uh, some some something I've had in my mind for a while. What happens in academia stays in academia, and I know Martin and I have have touched on this a little bit. Um, this uh, evidence practice gap and this turns up of course we see it in coach education of course um, and I think that in many ways if you want to call it the academia form of life is actually limiting its own impact what do you think Martin? Yeah this could be uh, creative resignation this could more <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're, we're both we were both academics as well, you know, all of us. Well, like, so yeah, Tony and so maybe Tony's um, an academic as well. So it's like, so you know, it's kind of an. In, I just think I've seen both sides of it, you know. So yeah, yeah, I just, I just think it, it it's not necessarily a sport issue, is it? I think it can it can cut across many different disciplines, um, mm. and maybe it, it's maybe relevant to what. Um, Dennis was discussing earlier, but I think probably one of the challenges, if we are if we're talking obviously sports specific here, is that a lot of the research that's carried out in in sport, uh, coaching, talent development, it's it's very reductionist. Therefore, by nature, it's going to be quite hard to transfer into practice because you're taking away so many different factors. But of course. It's quite hard for the academic as well because research that looks at or is conducted in very messy environments that's not necessarily trying to measure things isn't valued. Mm. So the academics caught in a caught between this this you know this dichotomy between producing 
what's deemed high quality academic work to progress, but then it might not be very transferable to a, a coach and a national governing body, somebody that's work, working in high performance. So there's a real issue, um, and that's and that's um, that has been recognised, I think, and that's perhaps why more unis are going down the route of like for Sheffield Allen, for example, is the most mm. best applied university, but then everything else needs to change within that organisation to support more real world research. Because it's never going to be neat and tidy. It's never going to be the best research design. It mm. can't be because you're conducting it in a, in a, in a complex environment. environment. You're, you're conducting it in a practice session where you've got so many factors that can influence it. It's a real challenge um, for both academia and, you know, applied practice. Mm, really good. Tony? Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes, you know, the work that goes on in academia doesn't always fit the narrative of, of, of what, what the kind of uh, clubs are looking for. And I think that that is part of the part of the issue. And it, it's interesting, Mark, that those ideas that have almost been propagated and stayed within coaching development and, and coach education have been the, the more popular sexy type things. So, mm -hmm. for example, the, the 10,000 hour rule or the, you know, the, 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 the certain learning styles and the, these kind of things. These, these, these are the areas of what I would call popular silence that haven't really had that kind of academic rigor or, or that that level of scrutiny behind it, but they seem to have taken off. So I think it's interesting. It's trying to get the balance between what's going to fit the narrative of the coach, but also, you know, trying to get the quality material out there. So we don't spend 10, 15, 20 years operating un under sort of a, a so-called popular silence. Popular silence isn't really uh, based on any level of foundation. I mean, the last thing I would say, Mark, is that I do feel that there's a role within certainly within a sporting organization or, or within within a club structure where you do have a research department and and somebody who's actually based within within the club to really bring this and tie this together and I think that's that's when it can be translated from academia to to the applied setting mm. and then from an applied setting going back into a to academia to say can we really answer these these messy real life questions and put a little bit of thought behind it that that's really gonna gonna benefit everybody and, and and take us on this learning journey. So I think it works both ways. Yeah, I mean, just to just to jump in there on Tony's point, he's, he's dead right, and it and it's not to say that academia it's not a hierarchy. You've got you've got for, for the work that uh, that we're doing with Keith at the minute on some ideas, some concepts is around. So you've got experiential knowledge on one side, you've got empirical knowledge and, the, and where the two meet in the middle, that's where we can get some real rich learning taking place, some real rich insight data that can inform practice. Because, you know, there's lots of highly experienced coaches, uh, performance managers that, that, that are essentially every day they walk into the club, they're collecting data, whether they realise it or not. And we need to draw on those experiences mm. with your with your theory and your your empirical data, which can overcome a lot of these issues like ten thousand hour and whatever it can be. So it's definitely a partnership. Oh, absolutely, Dennis. This resonates with uh, what we're doing at AIK. Do you think? Y yeah, uh, definitely. I. Um, and I'm really happy that that um, the research and development of the department is really embedded in the practice. Um, so it really makes makes it uh, less of a of a challenge to to actually have some effect. I mean, in some bigger clubs, you might have a research and development department, but the actual influence on on the practice is quite limited. Uh, so so that we actually have it embedded uh, in the club is something really really good and I would also like to uh, also just mention that if when, when you work with qualitative um, uh, research it might be hard to get samples it might be hard to 
persuade people with, with numbers and things like this. Uh, but uh, I would actually recommend to look at the complexity sciences in general and also natural sciences and evolution uh, because they operate on certain principles about complex system which you easily can then associate with practice and, and how would you go about to manipulate an environment to have the system uh, take a different shape or different form. Uh, so, so then you can actually root the principles of pedagogy in natural sciences. And that makes also a much stronger case um, that, than uh, you would if you would just point at a qualitative case study or whatever that you did in your own club. So it's that, that that's a, um, it, at least in my opinion, I found it very valuable uh, to, to, to do that. I think that goes right back to the Cesar Minotti quote, Dennis. Those who only know more about football don't know about football. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, I think that we need to look outside our domain for sure, and not mm. only outside football, but definitely outside sports and even outside society and to see what, what kind of principles does this society um, emerge from uh, and, mm. uh, or, or these species emerge from. Uh, or, you know, the, and uh, there's mm. so much, in my opinion, very valuable uh, things to find in, in those sort of domains. Mm. Absolutely. So, anyone got anything to add? Any questions? Oh. Hmm? No, uh, really appreciate your insights. This is a great discussion. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, really, 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 good. really, really good. Really cool. Really cool. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. Thanks, Dennis. Superb. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mark. Cheers, Jen. Well, Bye. listen, thanks, Tony. please stay healthy and stay safe. And we'll uh, talk again soon. Great stuff. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Bye, mate. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.